The MAIC is a great tool for process improvement. So let's go over the phases and how you actually use this wonderful thing. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video you may not have expected since, you know, one of my more popular videos is actually on do not use the MAIC for problem solving. And this video is going to be on please do use the MAIC. See, I'm absolutely not against the MAIC. The thing is, I have a bit of a narrow view on what is problem solving and what is improvements. And I think, I still think, you should not use the MAIC for that problem solving part. You should also not think of the MAIC as a simple light tool that we will quickly implement somewhere and just use as the go-to for lighter projects. Because a good the MAIC, it's not light. And as we'll also see, the DMAIC structure is a very good backbone, but it doesn't give too much support in what should you actually do. The DMAIC will be used very differently in different companies and industries. So even what I will be going over in, this will be sort of a mini series of six videos. This is the first and then each phase of the DMAIC will get their own video as well. It is just one of the ways. And even then, I'm showing a bunch of different tools, right? So the DMAIC is great for when you want to dive in to your process, understand it and improve it. Now the reason why a problem solving team usually will have a better alternative, which is like a single event analysis, my six step problem solving method, you know, check out that course. It really is a great way to solve things that basically you assume have a root cause. Right, a single root cause, maybe maybe two or three, but it was like an event that happened. So when we have a performance level that we know we can make, right, that, that's just our nice average that we have been hitting for weeks, months, maybe even years, and then suddenly performance drops. Then we talk about a problem. This is something you don't really want to solve with the make. You can. But don't get me wrong here, you absolutely can, but the make will not really help you a lot in doing that. All of the skills you need to do a good the make, they will all help you. Going through these videos that are coming up, it will help you. But when you go for more specific problem solving tools, then you get a, a quicker path because some assumptions are made. The main one of which is that there is going to be some root cause. Now, this works well if you see a drop in proven performance. When does the MAIC come around? And I mean, Kaizen events can definitely also do this in general problem solving can also do this, but the MAIC is a, a, a pretty strong tool set if you want to go for an actual process improvement. So an improvement in my book is when you take the previous performance level, but then you lift it to a better performance level than was previously achieved. And for that, you need to understand your process, make it more stable, optimize it, make the correct choices and inputs along the way. Now, there is one sort of special case, and uh, this is also why, also in the make, we talk a lot about problems and defect modes and stuff like that. And that is because there is a sort of problem solving here. I mean, a process with a lot of problems in it also has a too low performance level. And that's when we have sort of a shifting process. If that is your performance. And we want to sort of go to a better performance level, right? So you, you see that we have that average performance level going on there. Now, one of the ways that actually, in this case, sort of the way to get to a higher performance level is not to shift everything, but to say, you know what? I want to get rid of that bottom half of all these problems that we see occurring and just stay within this type of performance and effectively raise the performance level of my process a lot. That is a form of improvement that will definitely benefit from the MAIC much more than from any form of root cause problem solving because these here, they, do, they may have root causes for sure, but it's not for nothing already causes and it's not a sudden drop. So what those 
problem-solving methods do very well too is that they also assume that something suddenly happened. So many of the tools will be, let's make a timeline, let's make a description of what suddenly changed or what is now different. What and when did this problem occur? Here, these problems have been there for months or years. So what we're actually doing here is taking away a lot of process variation. Well, that means that you, you need to understand your process and you need to understand which inputs are important, where you have your influences, uh, what makes defects, how can you stabilize it. Lots of things that come in these phases of the MAIC. So let's go over those phases, okay? And as I said, we will have a dedicated video for each one of them, but the MAIC is first you define what you want to do, then you measure the current situation, you analyze how that all works, then you make an improvement, and then you really sort of implement it into the daily business. The, the actual implementation in the MAIC formally happens here, but it's, it's usually sort of between these steps. But here you make sure it sticks as well. So in the define phase, the main things, the goal of this phase is to, is to be really clear on the goals of the project, but also the business, also the customer. And it's not for nothing that resources are plural and goal is just the one. So you will have multiple goals and the business wants multiple things, the customer wants multiple things. In the end, you sort of get a bit of a collection of goals. Try to get your team, your project to focus onto one goal. It can have a couple of prerequisites for sure, but try not to go for those multi-goal type of projects if you can. Of course you want to keep performance level up and not lose other stuff, but those are more the prerequisites. What is that one thing you want to go for? So goal and then, very important, first steps of any sort of project, make sure you get your resources and that people sort of accept already. If you need money or people or time or machine downtime or whatever, right? And put this all into a project charter. And we'll also go into that a bit in that next video, of course. If you want to learn how to make and teach and write and all those things around the project chart, how to get clarity on this, my friends over at Belt Course have a very nice course you can do on this. A pretty light, but nice simulation where you don't just learn about it, but you actually do it with feedback. Really great system. I highly recommend you check that out as well. Then the measure phase is where we really dive into what is happening. Not so much the reasons behind it, but be really clear on the current process, the current product, what is happening, what ways does our problem present itself. Those are the big distinctions we make in that phase. And we want to dive into the loss mode, especially if we're talking this type of stuff where it's not per se finding the most optimal setting. So that is one way of process improvement that doesn't really use this, this mode concept. It's definitely very valuable as well. But when we are talking about defects or uh, low performance or uh, all kinds of small losses or problems that we see, we want to get into the mode in which they happen. See a defective plate is uh, perhaps a, a steel plate that has scratches on them. Each scratch is a defect. Now the plate is defective. But we want a defect mode, which is scratch on the top left 50 times per month, scratch on the bottom left two times per month, scratch on the right complete length once. And then you know you're not going to really focus on that one hey, something is happening in the top left of the plate. That is when you get into the mode. So the defect is a scratch, but the defect mode is much more specific. And you know, here it's scratch with a position. It can also be a specific way that a label was not printed correctly or a specific way that the discoloration happens or whatever specific way that a defect presents itself. Then we take that information and we're going to analyze how that happened. Now, what, what is our process doing and, and which causal factors lead up to 
our problems or which factors really affect our wanted outcome setting. Where do we have a lot of variation entering the output if we tweak some of the inputs? And alternatively, of course, which inputs make for the most stable process, the most defect-free process. But for that, we really need to know how our process behaves. So that causal tree of what causes other effects to happen, really important in the analyze phase. We want to know how these problems or these effects happen. And for that, we need to analyze our process. Here we get a number of the more statistical tools. So this is very descriptive statistics types. This is more physics, chemistry maybe even a bit. This is understanding what happens and how our inputs affect the outcome. Then, of course, when we know which inputs we have to tweak and which factors are really important to stabilize, to balance, to optimize, to whatever, now we want to improve them. And here it is important to improve, to be broad in what you might need to improve. It's not all about the machinery. So parts of that process, like the machinery and like how things are happening, is absolutely important. But also think about all of your inputs. The materials, the settings. Are settings processes or inputs? Eh, you tell me. But the temperature setting, the speed setting, how material is selected, what the material characteristics are, what we do to it, how we train people, how we work with it, all kinds of things on that process itself and the inputs to the process how can we stabilize those inputs? Very important in many domain type of projects to make sure that these first causes are not even happening so that we have the most stable process out there or maybe just not make any defects. Right? So that's what we test and sort of prove in the improve phase. Then the actual making it happen every day that is part of the control phase of the make. So the control phase has these two main things. We make sure that we validate that this improvement also works on industrial scale. And so here we did a couple of test trials. We switched it on and off and on and off. Okay, we're confident. Now we're gonna do it every day and without our engineers being there for every trial. Now we're just gonna do it with whatever material we have in the factory, whatever shift happens to be on shift at that moment. So make it sure that it runs under daily conditions, not just your trial conditions. So we validate that improvement and we sustain that change. And sustaining the change, that is what most people will think of in the control phase. These are the things like making sure that everybody is trained, but that you also check that the training worked, that you check the outcomes, the results, that you check if those inputs stay stable. So to validate is to make sure it works on the daily big scale, to sustain are all of those tools and systems that you use to make sure that it happens every day. Now, tomorrow and in a year. But it needs to become the new way of working, the new set of habits for everyone. So that is that control phase. We'll go through all of these because they sort of require their own video. The thing I did want to add is a DMAIC project easily takes you two months. Better to count three or four. So the define phase, well, a week or so, maybe better than a week, we can say it takes about eight hours or so for the eight you know, high intensity hours. So you could do it in a day, more likely within a couple of days, spread those hours a bit, but the measure, analyze, improve, control. Measure and analyze, sometimes you can do them quite fast in you know, time, but quite often you need machine and production hours to just gather your data, to, to check things out over a number of production runs. And purely because of that, you can already usually not do this within a day. So this takes a couple of weeks. The improved part where you actually test what you're doing. So you need to order some new stuff from time to time. You need to plan trial runs. You need to check that. So 
the workload for the team is not full time, it's not 100%, but again, it, it easily takes a couple of weeks. And then in the control phase, all of your shifts need to have produced. To prove that you're sustaining things, I mean, you need multiple shifts for each of the teams. Now, what you can, of course, do is say, okay, at some point this falls outside of the project team, we sort of follow up, good, fine. But if all of them take a couple of weeks, three months is easily done with this. So do not consider the make to be the quick way of doing stuff. For that, we tend to use a Kaizen event, also a very nice way of doing things, or just a, a quick root cause analysis, because if we're doing this here, the answer is already in our know-how. But if we're doing this, we are changing something in our process. And that almost always takes a lot more time. So absolutely watch the other videos in this little mini series and do indeed also use the make where appropriate. It is a really nice system. I hope that this you know, sort of jogged your, I wanna do this. If you have that one, check out my course on problem solving. But if you wanna know how to also do this very lucrative part, hit that like button and stick around for the other videos. For now, I wish you the best of luck improving your processes. And as always, don't forget to also enjoy the continuous improvement journey.